guys, and welcome to the Moms and Murder podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing awesome. How are you? I'm also doing awesome. Feels like I was mocking Yay. you there. I promise I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I never get a sing-songy response out of you. <laughs> <laughs> really? That seems like my personality. Really weird. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's kind of my um, area. Yeah, you can have it. Giggling What's and, the and thing? laughing. What yeah. is the word for that we learned last week? A, g- a giggle gog. Or wait, no, a grinagog. You're a grinagog, <laughs> yeah. And I'm just a gog. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, so I feel like I've had a great week this week. Um, like we talked about last week, it was my son's birthday coming up. So we had that. We had a great time celebrating my little guy. He's officially eight years old. Crazy. And Time just marches on. It is so crazy. Um, yeah, so it's been a great week. And I have, there are things, fun things to look forward to. Uh, my mom's actually coming to visit us in a couple of weeks. Yay. And we're all really excited. Yeah, we haven't seen my mom in, I, it's been a long time. I don't, my kids haven't seen her in about two and a half years. So everybody's so excited wow. that Nana is coming to visit. So yeah, that's um, that's the big news around here this week. What that's about awesome. you, Melissa? Oh, I uh, closed the door on my finger and it didn't break, but it bruised really nicely. So that was a good one. (laughs) I was like literally waiting for it to be broken. And my son was like, let's go, mom, mom. And I'm like, you know, like you feel everything blacking out. And I was like, I just need a minute. Just give me a minute. But I have a pretty gnarly bruise, but it's not broken. So there's my good news for the week. It's basically the same as yours. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. Some of the worst pain I've ever felt is like in the smallest of areas, you know, like a finger or a toe or something. So I totally get it. I'm sure that hurt like crazy. Yeah. All right. So we will get right into the episode this week. I think this is going to be a long one because there's a lot, um, there's just a lot of information (laughs) to this case. And just when you think you've heard everything that there is to hear in this story, then there's more still to come. So we are just going to jump right into it. So we don't waste any time this week. So we've heard countless stories about how affairs have ripped apart families and even have become contributing factors in numerous homicides. And this is another one of those stories. But this story is somehow even more appalling than you could possibly imagine. And there's really a lot to unpack. Although there's only one murder victim, there are numerous victims in the story that all suffered in some way at the hands of a conniving woman named Celeste Beard. On the surface, Celeste seemed like a pretty average woman. She was a mother of twins who had really just been unlucky in love and had been divorced three times. But it seemed like she finally found her fairy tale when she met her fourth husband, a man who brought to the table millions of dollars. So maybe that isn't really average, but then again, neither was Celeste. And the circumstances of her life were actually anything but average. It just wasn't until October 2nd, 1999, that the walls all came crashing down when Celeste's husband, Stephen, awoke in the night and realized that he had somehow been critically injured while he was sleeping. It was about three o'clock in the morning when Stephen himself dialed 911. On the call, he sounded relatively calm and very focused as he told the 911 operator what was going on. And he just matter of factly said, my guts are in my hands, which... Oh my gosh, I can't imagine as a 911 operator, you're thinking, what is happening right now? What is this call all about? So he said he had no idea what happened. As I said, it was three o'clock in the morning. He was awakened from his sleep and realizes he is badly injured in his abdomen area. And all he really knew was that he was in a massive amount of pain and he was bleeding heavily. So the operator asked if he was alone in the house, and he said, no, my wife Celeste is here somewhere, but I don't know where she is. So officers were immediately dispatched, and when they arrived, they saw Steve through a sliding glass side door of the house, and they could tell that he was in really bad shape, as in not going to get up and open the door for them. So the officers broke the sliding glass window to get inside. One officer went to the front door to unlock it and let in the other first responders. And that's when they found Stephen's wife, Celeste, and her daughter, Christina. They had allegedly been in another room when Steve was hurt. However, he was hurt. They didn't know, allegedly. So Celeste's behavior and her emotional reactions were kind of erratic. The officers on scene said that the hysterics were, quote, up and down, and that she would go from being very upset to not being very upset. She was kind of doing this crying but not having any real tears thing, which is something we've heard in other stories. Yeah. 
where, you know, they show up and the, the way that they're reacting doesn't match what their body language is actually saying. So Celeste was also overheard making some pretty weird commentary. And one of the things that she said was, quote, this is perfect timing. We were supposed to go to Europe tomorrow. So she was kind of trying to be sarcastic, but it still is a very strange thing to say when you're you supposedly don't know what's going on. Your husband is yeah. really, really badly hurt. And there are first responders in your house at three in the morning. You you know, it's just a strange thing to even to make any kind of a joke at that point. Yeah. So the officers searched the house and they found one spent shotgun shell. And so they realized then that Steve had actually been shot in the stomach with a shotgun, which is absolutely just miraculous that he was conscious and able to even call 911 in the yeah. first place. So he was taken in an ambulance. And when he arrived at the hospital, he was placed in ICU for several weeks. So before we go any further with how Steve is doing, we're going to back it up a little bit. And we're going to talk about the relationship of Stephen and Celeste. Stephen and Celeste weren't exactly high school sweethearts. Uh, she had been married three times before and they also weren't really newlyweds either. They first met back in 1993, and Stephen was married at the time to another woman named Elise. The two of them had been married for over 40 years, and at this time, Elise was in the later stages of cancer, and she was seriously ill. Stephen and Elise frequented Austin Country Club in Austin, Texas, and that's where they met Celeste, who worked there as a server. Stephen and Elise were regular customers of hers. Stephen was a Texas native. He was born on November 27, 1924 in Dallas to parents Stephen and Mildred. He was a hardworking guy and was described as being very smart and amiable and, quote, had magical touch as a businessman. He was very successful, and by the time he met Celeste at the country club, he's in his late 60s, pushing 70. He was a big-time TV executive. He actually owned Austin TV station KBVO. And with that, he becomes very, very rich. He had a really happy life with his wife, Elise, and she was actually a former model for Neiman Marcus. And the two, like we said, were together for over 40 years. The two had three kids named Becky, Stephen III, and Paul. When Elise was diagnosed with cancer, it devastated the family and Stephen. Elise passed away in October of 1993. According to Stephen's daughter, he was lost and lonely without his wife. Following the death of his wife, Stephen was really all alone. Country club manager asked Celeste to go to Stephen's house and help him with a few things. Like we said, he's a regular customer. His wife is. They know each other pretty well. And so she does go over there. Ten days after Stephen buries his wife, Stephen asks Celeste on a date. But kind of a little complicated situation here. Celeste is still married to her third husband named Jim, Although at this time, things between the two of them were really on the rocks. Celeste had quite a long history with being in these bad relationships. And some of this could be due to the fact that she really had a very troubling upbringing. She was born on February 19th, 1963 in LA County, California. When she was born, her mother gave her up for adoption. And she didn't know her biological mother, a woman named Kathleen. Kathleen was 35 when she had Celeste, and she actually gave her up the day she was born. Later on, Celeste meets Kathleen, and Kathleen is incredibly cold and callous towards her. And she point blank told Celeste that if it were legal, she would have had an abortion. She never wanted to have Celeste. And she also told oh her my gosh. Yeah, that she has no idea who Celeste's biological father was. Celeste would go on to be adopted by Edwin and Nancy Johnson. The two of them had a total of four adopted kids, and Celeste was the second in the family. The family was described as a, quote, everyday dysfunctional family. Celeste had one older brother and brother and sister that were younger than her. Edwin and Nancy were very religious. They were active in their church, and they raised their adopted kids in the church. They weren't super wealthy or anything, but Celeste had really all that she needed and more. But sadly, Celeste's adopted family was very abusive. Celeste was molested by her adopted father and her brother as a young child. When Celeste was 13 years old, her parents divorced. Her brothers went to live with her dad, and Celeste and her sister lived with her mom. During this time, Celeste really struggled. It's, of course, a really hard time in a kid's life as it is, and now her life is changing once again. And so she really struggled during these early teen years, which, as somebody with a preteen, both of us, 
it's difficult already. <laughs> it's just yeah, a difficult, yeah. <laughs> difficult life without all these other things going on. It really is really tough for them. Absolutely. Yeah. At this time, she's diagnosed with depression, suicidal ideation, and PTSD. She's hospitalized for these conditions multiple times. At 15, she was almost 16, her sister's boyfriend introduced Celeste to an 18-year-old named Craig Bratcher. Craig and Celeste started a relationship, they got an apartment, and they moved in together. This is when she is just 16 years old. I can't imagine moving out of my parents' house at 16. I actually did move out pretty early. I moved out as soon as I turned 18, but that was really, I felt too early. Um, I can't imagine moving out at 16 and how hard that would just be. You're just, you're, you don't realize at the time that you're just setting yourself up for things to be really, really hard for you whenever you get an apartment at the age of 16. Yeah. So things weren't really very harmonious between Celeste and Craig. And Craig turned out to be a really jealous and a really controlling boyfriend. He never wanted Celeste to do anything without him, and he eventually started physically abusing her. He would hit her, shove her, and he actually burned and stabbed her, which is really wow. extreme. So you can just imagine the level of abuse that she was enduring with this guy. So just a few months after they moved into this apartment, Celeste found out that she was pregnant. And Craig was, I guess you could say, the opposite of being supportive. He really was not happy at all. In fact, he was angry. And he wanted Celeste to get an abortion, but Celeste refused to do so, which, of course, made Craig very, very mad. And he physically assaulted her, and he would hit her in the stomach, hoping that she would miscarry this baby. Despite this terrible abuse, the two of them got married on December 6th, 1980, because Celeste allegedly said that she did not want to have an illegitimate child. If Craig was angry about one baby, you can imagine how he must have reacted when it was learned that Celeste was actually pregnant with twins. When Celeste was only seven months pregnant and just 17 years old, the two baby girls were born on February 6th, 1981. Each of them barely weighed three pounds, and they had to be transported to a different hospital that had a NICU. Celeste didn't get to see her babies for five days, and she wasn't able to touch or hold them oh, for man. several weeks. Just awful. So heartbreaking. Um, but after three months in the NICU, the babies were healthy enough and strong enough, and they were ready to go home. So Celeste and Craig brought the babies home. But Craig continued to be abusive. And at this point, he was drinking enough to be considered an alcoholic, really. And it got to the point that his drinking was so heavy that he checked into rehab for alcohol abuse in the late summer of 1981. So this is when the twins are just about six months old. So after rehab, Craig, Celeste, and the twins moved to Washington to be closer to Craig's mom, which was something that Craig's counselor suggested. You know, why don't you move to Washington where you have family, you know, in support? And I can see why his counselor would suggest something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But it turned out that that wasn't going to be very helpful. Um, once they got to Washington and got settled in, Craig just resumed drinking and he continued to be physically violent towards Celeste. In one night, they were in a fight, and he actually broke her arm. And Celeste, you know, went to the doctor, had a cast put on, and then she packed up her things, and she took the twins and left and drove back to California where they came from. But this separation from Craig didn't last long. After Craig threatened suicide, Celeste actually took him back. And it wasn't long, again, before Craig started abusing her. He was arrested and jailed numerous times for domestic violence, but every time he got out, he just quickly resumed the abuse once again. In the fall of 1983, Celeste finally left Craig again, and she actually made an attempt to get her life kind of on track. She enrolled in college, and she actually completed a course and got a degree in accounting. And she started seeing a therapist, and she really was just trying to, like I said, get on her feet. Yeah. She worked a couple of part-time jobs to make her ends meet, and eventually she filed for divorce and was officially divorced from Craig on September 22nd, 1983. So Craig really was not phased by any of this. He didn't care that they were divorced. He didn't care that Celeste had left the relationship and, you know, they were supposed to be kind of on separate paths now. They still have these twins together. So when Celeste would go to drop off their twins or to pick them up after visitation, that's when Craig would direct his abusive behavior at her, which is just so scary, like that she can't get away from him, right. you know, hurting her like repeatedly. It's really, really terrible. So Celeste ended up moving into a battered woman's shelter. 
Sadly, there were no room for the babies there. So Celeste voluntarily put the girls in protective custody until she was able to secure housing for all three of them. And soon after, she did do just that. She got a house and she got a job as a receptionist and she got her twins back. And the twins continued to go see Craig on the weekends for supervised visits. In January of 1986, Celeste is now 23 years old and the twins are almost five years old. At this point, Celeste is working and she and her boss take a liking to each other. He really treated her really well, treated her like a princess, and eventually he proposed to her even though they had no physical relationship, they had not been intimate at all before. When the wedding date drew closer, her boss Gary told Celeste that he had herpes and they broke up. A little bit of a fun fact about Gary, he was actually 65 years old at this time. And so it, it just seems like a pattern in her life where she she kind of starting here started dating men that were um, quite a bit older than her. When this relationship ends, Celeste is totally distraught and she really felt like if she didn't have a man in her life, you know, something's not right. And so the twins at this time beg Celeste to get back together with their dad, Craig, which is so sad because they just think it's my mom and my dad being together, not knowing, you know, what that can really mean. And they're just five years old. So they don't, they have no clue. They don't know. They're just kids, babies. So in February of 1986, that's exactly what Celeste did. She called Craig. He lived in Arizona at the time and tells him that she wants to reconcile. So Celeste and the twins move there, and they move into his house. The day they moved in, Craig raped Celeste. He then beat her and stabbed her in the hip with a five-inch blade. Celeste calls the police, and they take her to the emergency room where Craig is arrested again. So now they're in Arizona, and Celeste and the girls find a battered women's shelter to live in. A few months pass, and Celeste actually finds out that she's pregnant, as a result of this rape. She needed hospitalization during this pregnancy due to severe dehydration. The twins were once again placed in protective custody while Celeste was in the hospital. Once released, they all went back to live with Craig. My gosh. And of course, Craig continues his abusive and violent ways. When Celeste is seven and a half months pregnant, she decides to put this baby up for adoption. And she gave birth to a little girl born in November of 1986. Later in 1986, Celeste leaves Craig. After this, he stalks her, is obsessed with her. She gets a restraining order and moves back to Washington. During this time, she tries to get back on her feet. She gets a job and she hires a babysitter to look after her girls. This babysitter introduces Celeste to a friend named Harold. By February of 1987, just a few short months later, Celeste and Harold were a thing and they were living together and the couple married on August 26, 1988. Harold was really nothing like Craig. He was dependable, he was kind, he was a member of the U.S. Air Force and he doted on Celeste and her twins. He was a very faithful husband and father, but he wanted to have kids of his own. Celeste suffered through multiple ectopic pregnancies and eventually had to have a complete hysterectomy. Harold was really upset deep down by this. He really wanted to have kids and knew that this would not biologically be possible anymore. And so at this point, their relationship kind of drifts apart. Harold was allegedly told that he needed to go to Iceland with the Air Force and that his family was not allowed to go with him. Once he leaves... He stops communicating with Celeste and stops putting money into their joint account. Celeste eventually files for divorce, and then she enlists in the Air Force. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. When she enlists in the Air Force, she has to give up custody of her twins while she's at boot camp. And so she sends them to live back with her dad, Craig, in Washington. And she said that she felt at this time that Craig seemed clean and sober and had remarried, so she thought that, you know, this would be a good decision, that this would be good for the girls. Celeste hires a divorce attorney named Stuart to help her from this divorce from Harold. Somehow, I guess when you've lost in love and you found a lawyer, you can fall in love with your attorney. (laughs) And he is, uh, he's nearly 70 years old. The couple get engaged And Celeste decides basically, I don't want to be in the Air Force anymore. So Stuart talks to the Air Force and 
got them to agree not to force Celeste to complete her enlistment, which, wow, wow, I didn't even know that was ever possible. That's pretty amazing. Um, So after this short relationship, Stuart breaks things off with Celeste. So Celeste was once again on her own and really just trying to figure out her life. You have to remember all throughout this, Celeste is very young. She's only in her early to mid-20s while all this is going on. She is not very – she hasn't had a lot of life experience at this point, and she's had a really rough time, you know, up to this point. So she's still just trying to figure things out. So one night she went to a bar and she got drunk and – The bartender actually took her keys from her. So she was trying to convince this bartender to give her back her keys so that she could leave. So then a random man at the bar walked up to Celeste and this man was named Jimmy Martinez. And he said, quote, I'm going to marry you and move you to Texas. And Celeste said, "Okay." And literally two weeks later, Celeste moved to Dallas, Texas with this man, Jimmy Martinez, that she met at a bar while she was drunk. Um, so the twins at this time, as we said, were still living in Washington with Craig, but Celeste was fighting to get custody back on August 24th, 1991, Celeste actually got married to Jimmy in Vegas. And this was her third marriage. And as I said, she's 28 years old before long, Jimmy's job transferred him back to Arizona. And so Celeste and Jimmy moved to Tucson, but things weren't really that great in their relationship, just as they hadn't been great in many of Celeste's previous relationships. But this time it was actually Celeste who started having a little bit of an issue. She started drinking heavily and her marriage to Jimmy started falling apart less than a year in, really. In 1992, Celeste was arrested and convicted of felony fraud and she was given four years of probation. She served two years and then paid restitution and she was discharged early. So she and Jimmy were still married through all of this, but then he was transferred to Austin, Texas in 1992, so they moved again. By this time, Celeste twins are 12 years old. Craig actually let one of them, Christina, move to Texas to live with Celeste, and the other daughter, Jennifer, stayed in Washington with Craig. But issues emerged when Christina and Jimmy met each other, and they really didn't get along. It was during this time that Celeste took the job waiting tables at the Austin Country Club, which is where she met Stephen Beard and his wife, Elise, who were members and frequented the club. So it's at this point in her life kind of where, you know, she's on her third marriage. It's not going well. It's really still pretty fresh and new. It's less than three years in. Now she has her preteen daughter in the mix living with her and her new husband, and things are just kind of on the rocks. So this is the this is the point in her life when she meets Stephen Beard. And we're going to get into a lot more details of this story after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. It seems like we were just in January talking about New Year's resolutions, and now it's March, and we're looking forward to the summertime. Whether you make healthy changes in your life or not, time is going to keep on ticking. If you want to take charge of your time and your life, look no further than Noom. Noom is based in psychology and works with your lifestyle. There isn't some rigorous plan you have to commit to to have success on your journey to a healthier you with Noom. And Noom is forgiving. I'm human, and some days I'm going to go off track, and that's okay. Noom is there to encourage me to keep trying and get back on track tomorrow. And because Noom knows we're all busy, they simply want you to commit to 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes is basically one commercial break during the Real Housewives of New Jersey. I love that with Noom, I have more energy and I'm actually enjoying the process of eating better and exercising because it doesn't feel like this all or nothing thing I can't ever screw up because Noom is created for real people. Plus, over 80% of Noomers finish the program, and to date, over 60% have stuck with their goals for at least one year, which is incredible. There's a science to getting healthier. It's called Noom. Sign up for your trial today at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash moms. Learn how to eat again with Noom. Sign up for your trial today at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash moms. Ready to learn how to live healthier? Sign up for Noom today at N-O-O-M dot com slash moms. Sometimes in life, things can be good one minute and start to feel out of control the next. Your mind is all over the place and you're struggling to find balance and peace. Or maybe you have critical things going on in your life that you need to discuss with someone and just have the opportunity to let it all out. 
BetterHelp Online Counseling may be the solution you've been looking for. I signed up for BetterHelp last year, and when I signed up, I took a short quiz to find out what I was looking for in a counselor and was matched right away to a therapist who I actually really enjoy talking to. My counselor is helping me work through some things that I've actively been trying to avoid, and I love that I have the option to speak with her by video chat or phone calls. I personally prefer phone calls so I can look like a hot mess while we talk, plus I can message her throughout the week just to check in. She sent me articles to read and makes me feel like she's genuinely invested in the things I want to work on. Being able to speak to my counselor from my home and at times that I can make work is one of the best gifts I've been able to give myself and my family. Everything you share with your counselor is confidential and BetterHelp can help match you with a counselor who is specialized in things like depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, trauma, and more. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. We want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash moms. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash moms. And now back to the episode. So before the break, we were talking about Celeste and her third husband, Jimmy, and how they had just moved to Austin, and Celeste has gotten this job waiting tables at the country club. As we said, things were really tense at this point between Celeste and Jimmy. Not only were they not getting along, but Jimmy also didn't get along with Christina, who was Celeste's 12-year-old daughter, who had come to live with the couple. At some point in the beginning of 1993, Celeste and Jimmy both agreed that their marriage was really all but over. So when Stephen Beard asked Celeste out on a date a couple of weeks after his wife had tragically passed away of cancer, Celeste thought it was okay to accept this offer. On July 5th, 1994, Celeste and Jimmy made their divorce official, and Celeste continued to see and date the recently widowed, grieving Stephen Beard. Like many of the men in Celeste's past, Stephen was much older than her. He was nearly 70, and at this time, Celeste was just 32. Despite the age difference, which had never stopped her before, Celeste and Stephen were legally married on February 18, 1995, which is less than a year after her divorce from Jimmy. Christina, who was a young teen at this time, continued to live with Celeste and her new husband, while her twin, Jennifer, stayed with Craig in Washington. That was until Craig took his own life, and Jennifer moved to Texas and moved in with her mom, her sister, and Stephen. Living with Stephen was a really different type of life than Celeste and the girls were used to. Stephen had a lot of money, and he went on to adopt the twins and actually changed his will to include them. He even commissioned the building of a new home in a really expensive subdivision for this new family. At the time, Stephen had around $7 million in assets, which is equal to about $11 million today. And most of his assets were in a revocable trust. After they were married, Celeste and Stephen signed an agreement where Stephen promised to give Celeste $1 million during their marriage. If the couple divorced, Stephen would give her $500,000. I don't understand that. I don't understand the whole thing about like, I promise to give you a million dollars over the course of our marriage. Like, what is that all about? I need to, I don't know. Like, I just didn't realize that was a thing that people did. Well, and then at the end of the million dollars, are you like, whoa, 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 no groceries for you. You've reached your right. limit. Like, I don't understand how that works. Yeah, exactly. It just seems weird. So like while you're married, your husband just pays you money. I mean, it doesn't sound that weird. It sounds great. I didn't mean weird. I don't like know that. how I mean, to get on this wonderful. plan. I'm just interested in how <laughs> I, I need a how-to class on this. Thank you. You just get like monthly payments. Like, here you go until you hit a million dollars. I mean, that sounds lovely, but I just didn't know that was a yeah. thing. But Steve really seemed to care about Celeste and her daughters. He built not one, but two houses. The first one he built when they first got married, and then he goes on to build a lake house later. Collectively, these homes were valued at over $1 million. Stephen's cash and his personal property were valued at $426,000. During this time, Celeste is getting monthly cash payments from Stephen's estate. She would get between $7,500 and $10,500 a month. Well, there you go. That answers how it gets paid. Yeah, that's how <laughs> that's how you're getting your dollars. So Stephen also adds Celeste to his will. And in his will, it says whenever he dies, she inherits the house, the lake house, and half of all the other assets. And this is a total value of around $3.5 million. Keep in mind, he has three other kids. Celeste isn't his kid, but he also has three kids and he's giving her half. 
So in January of 1997, Stephen transferred $500,000 from his trust to a revocable trust that he set up for Celeste. This money was half of that promised marital money of a million dollars. And also this means if they get divorced, his obligation to her is satisfied. So that $500,000 she would get if they got divorced, here it is now. And so spend it wisely <laughs> because this is what you're going right. to get. It takes Celeste less than six months to spend the entire $500,000. This is like I feel like I could the do premise that. <laughs> of blank check. I would just be like, I don't know, I know. what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> That's a lot of Diet Cokes. So shortly after Celeste blew through this money, Stephen files for divorce. But two months later, he withdraws the petition and the couple get back together. One of the things that actually led Stephen to filing for divorce in the first place is this made me so upset. He finds out that Celeste is stealing silver and expensive jewelry from this safety deposit box that he had where he kept some of his late wife's things. And so he, Oh my god. Yeah. Gosh. Like how are you not getting enough lady that you have to steal from his dead wife? Come on now. Oh man. Yeah, like that's, that's just awful. about as low as you can go. But the twins were really happy to have Stephen as their stepfather. He really loved them. He doted on them, gave them affection gave him stability, and Celeste really was not an affectionate mother, so the girls seemed to really crave that attention. Christina, in particular, grew really attached to Stephen. But despite all Stephen did to love and provide for Celeste and the kids, Celeste was never really happy. She was nice to Stephen's face, but behind his back, she was really rude and nasty, and it wasn't really a secret that she didn't really like him at all. Despite all he's done for her, even if you just look at take away the money, take away the things, he's really good to your kids. I feel like I could right. I could definitely marry this man. But you know what I mean? Like he's really good to your kids. Your kids seem to really like him. Like you could be nice to this guy. So Celeste's daughter Jennifer said that Celeste would, quote, say she loves Stephen to his face. Then we'd walk off. She'd flip him off and joke about his weight, end quote. Yikes. Yeah. So in November of 1998, Celeste actually started having an affair, and it was with one of her ex-husbands, Jimmy. So this was the third husband that she – that met her at a bar and whisked her away to Texas after, you know, just meeting her that night. So this affair lasted several months and went on into the following year. While Celeste was carrying on this affair, she was still married to poor Stephen, and her mental health really started to t kind of unravel at this point. In early 1999, Celeste threatened to shoot herself in front of her daughter, Christina, and Christina called 911, and Celeste was actually taken to a hospital where she was evaluated, and it was determined that she needed further treatment, so she was sent to St. David's Pavilion, which is a psychiatric hospital. At this hospital, she befriended a fellow patient named Tracy Tarleton, and this was a woman who was a bookstore manager, and she was at St. David's Pavilion for treatment of her bipolar disorder, so this is where she meets Celeste. So Tracy was a lesbian, and that was a very well-known fact about her. It was not something that she kept a secret. And when she met Celeste, she felt this attraction to her that was more than just being friends. But Celeste, who had never been interested in dating women up to this point, I guess thought, you know, there was something there with Tracy and started having this flirtatious relationship with her. So as the story goes on, there's actually conflicting accounts of what the relationship between Celeste and Tracy was really all about, but Tracy alleged that this was a romantic relationship, and this becomes an important factor later on in the story. So after Celeste flirted and formed this relationship, whatever it was with Tracy, they both decided that they wanted to be transferred to another facility for their treatment, and they wanted to go to Timberlawn Hospital in Dallas. They both did get transferred, and they got to share a room while they were together at this new place, and this is when their relationship allegedly becomes a sexual relationship. When the staff at the facility learned that this was going on, they put Tracy in another room and, you know, separated the two of them. But, you know, Celeste was really unhappy about this, and she told Tracy that this was all Stephen's fault. You know, it wasn't because mm. the staff was upset with them. It was because her husband, Stephen, wanted them separated, and that's what was going on there. So soon enough, both of the women were discharged, and they became outpatients. But they started meeting each other at motels, and they would get rooms for the night, and really this more intimate and intense relationship started to form. They continued to see each other regularly during that summer and during the fall of 1999. 
their relationship or friendship, whatever you want to call it, started progressing. And Celeste started to confide in Tracy. And she talked a lot about how, you know, she felt trapped in this marriage with Steven. She said it was a loveless marriage. She claimed that she only married him so that she would look good and she'd be able to get custody of her daughters back. And, you know, she said she just wasn't happy. She said Steven was controlling her entire life and she felt trapped under him. And, you know, said that he used his money to get his way. He pushed her around. He pushed everyone around, according to Celeste. She told Tracy that she didn't marry Stephen for his money, but she also said that she couldn't just divorce him now because then she would only get the $500,000. So basically she's saying, I didn't marry him for his money, but now that it's on the table, (laughs) you know, I can't. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I can't just leave him now because then I only get, you know, half a million dollars, which I've already spent. So that's not going to work for her. Celeste voiced her opinion that Stephen was really the only thing that was standing in her way of having a relationship with Tracy. Celeste began drugging Stephen so that she could leave the house at night and go stay with Tracy. So she started putting sleeping pills in his food and she was allegedly replacing his vodka with Everclear. And this combination of things made Stephen pass out early, you know, and be out for the whole night. And so Celeste was free to do really whatever she wanted, which was to spend time with Tracy. Celeste told Tracy that she hoped doing these things to Stephen would really cause an early death on his part. As we said, he's already, you know, he's nearly 70 years old. So Celeste is over here saying like, oh, you know, just a little bit of sleeping pills, a little bit of this. Maybe it will, you know, help him along. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, just really awful, just a terrible, awful thing to say. But she said, quote, he's an old man. He's going to die, but not soon enough. And I'm just going to help him along wherever I can, end quote. That's a lot. There was one particular night in the fall of 1999 when Celeste actually called Tracy and asked her to come over. And when Tracy got there, she saw that Stephen was sitting at the dining room table unconscious. And Celeste, you know, was like, hey, can you help me move him to the floor? And so she did, and Celeste then put a trash bag over Stephen's head and tried to suffocate him, but it didn't work. This is all while Tracy is there. Um, Yeah, and this wasn't the only time that Tracy said Celeste had tried to kill her husband. The two women allegedly came up with a plan together to poison Stephen with botulism, which is such... I just wouldn't even know where to start with that, but apparently they had a book of poison recipes i don't know why that's a thing why there's an entire like encyclopedia of how to make poisons like i don't know i don't that blew my mind too um but they used a recipe out of this book to grow the necessary components for botulism so that they could try and poison steven this is very extensive and clearly very premeditated planned so here's the thing i thought botulism no that's the thing you can't give a baby honey before they're one right because the fear of botulism yes but then what is the thing where somebody drills into your skull and puts poison in it what's that's a lo- oh, oh wait, yeah, that's what lobotomy I'm thinking. Is- lobotomy is what I'm confusing it with. And I was like, poison lobotomy? I don't understand what's going on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so clearly I would have needed a book to take this on as well. Right. So these two women also gave Stephen 10 ecstasy pills one time without his knowledge, and this was in an effort to kill him. At this time, Tracy was really just believing everything Celeste said about what a terrible person her husband was and how miserable she was. And Tracy felt bad for Celeste and really wanted to help her. Celeste became so dramatic over all of this that she eventually told Tracy that she was going to kill herself if Tracy did not kill her husband, Stephen, for her. Wow. Finally, in October of 1999, after listening to all of Celeste's claims, Tracy finally breaks down and agrees to help her murder her husband. She really had no plan to do it, but because Celeste kept threatening suicide, Tracy ends up changing her mind. And Tracy makes Celeste promise that if she goes through with this, that she will find a home for her pets, pay her legal fees, and support her in jail if she gets caught, which tells me that you're thinking uh, you could get caught. So, like... Why would you do it? Right, right. Like, you know, sometimes we hear people and they're just so arrogant and don't think they can get away with anything. And she's saying like, I've watched Dateline. I know that this could happen. Here's what I need for you to do for me. So it's wow that she even goes along with this. So Celeste agrees to these conditions. And Tracy and Celeste meet at Celeste's house on October the 1st to plan this shooting. Stephen had planned to take Celeste on a three-week trip to Europe, which I'm assuming is outside of this $500,000 spending spree she's gotten, but 
Celeste right? says that, you know, she didn't really want to go. And she tells Tracy that she's worried that Stephen's emotional abuse would lead her to suicide while they were on the trip. Celeste then asks Tracy to shoot Stephen before the trip so she doesn't have to go. Celeste sends her daughter Jennifer to someone else's house for the night, and her daughter Christina would be at home in another room. Celeste shows Tracy where to park, how to get inside the house, and tells her where Stephen's going to be sleeping that night. So Tracy points out that the shotgun shell is going to be ejected from the shotgun she was planning to use, and Celeste said, you know, no worries, no problem, I'll find the shell and I'll get rid of it. Celeste even made the suggestion to shoot Stephen in the stomach so it would be, quote, less messy. So Celeste turns off their security system and unlocks the door. When Stephen's finally asleep, Celeste gives a go-ahead. It was about 3 a.m. when Tracy enters the Beard's home and makes her way into the room where Stephen's sleeping. Without hesitation, Tracy goes straight into the room, points a shotgun at Stephen, fired one time, and then she flees. He's hit in the abdomen, but he didn't die. Instead, he wakes up confused, no idea what's happened, finds his guts are hanging out of his body, and calls 911 for help. So when he calls 911 for help, we mentioned before, he's fully conscious, and being able to make this call is, or you know, extraordinary. Can you imagine noticing that your guts are coming out of your body and being, like, coherent on a phone call? I just can't even imagine, like... I can't imagine what's going through your mind when you wake up like that and you don't immediately see like there's no shooter in your room. Like you don't immediately have – you don't know what just happened. All you know is that you are hurt. Somebody has attacked you in some way and something is going on and like you have to call 911 and get help. I just – I can't imagine your whole thought process. And then just really not even knowing what happened. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's not like – it's not a game of Clue. You can't look around and say, well, there's the shotgun and the billiard room and all that stuff. It's just like, okay, my – this is what's this is what I see right now. Help me. I don't know what's happened. I can't even imagine. There's got to be like part of you that thinks you're in a dream because how is this even happening? Yeah. So he gives his last name, his address all through these, you know, labored breaths as he's just trying to hold on. And so he even says, quote, hurry, my guts just jumped out of my stomach. I'm in awful pain, end quote. The operator asked even, you know, how this happened. And he said, quote, I heard nothing. I've been sleeping. I just woke up, end quote. And so the operator asks if he's alone there, and Stephen says his wife Celeste is there. We talked about that earlier, but he doesn't know where she is in the house. So Stephen's loaded into the ambulance and rushed to the hospital. Celeste and Christina were found in the house and appeared to be shocked by this news that Stephen had been shot. One officer said this was a medical emergency, and Celeste breaks down in tears. Sort of. She's crying, but there's no real tears, and she's very up and down emotionally. And that's when she made that weird comment about how, oh, great, this is perfect timing because we were supposed to go to Europe the next day. When Steve was taken to the hospital, Celeste and Christina followed behind. The police did find one spent shotgun shell in the house, meaning that Celeste had not done what she promised Tracy she was going to do, and she did not gather up that shell and dispose of it. When Celeste's other twin daughter, Jennifer, heard the news, she and her boyfriend drove from the lake house where they were staying that night, and they went to the hospital to meet up with Celeste and Christina. Officers talked to Christina and Jennifer that morning, and they actually gave the police Tracy's name. Later that same day, Celeste was talking to her girls and, you know, kind of going over what was happening and the fact that the police were going to be questioning everybody. And she says, hey, if the police come talking to you, don't tell them anything about Tracy. But at this point, it was too late because the girls had already talked to the police and they had already given Tracy's name. Celeste also told Christina not to talk to the police at all. And, of course, Christina was the one who was in the house that night when all this went down. Jennifer was the twin who was staying at the lake house, so I guess she was fine with Jennifer talking to the police because it wasn't as risky right. because Jennifer wasn't there and, you know, couldn't give any accounts of, you know, from inside the house from that night. Celeste also told Christina that if the police asked, she should tell them that Celeste loved Stephen and she would never do anything to hurt him. Which, if you have to coach your kid to say these things, like, that doesn't look really great, you know? Right. Like, they should be already, they should already be saying those things to the police without you having to tell them. Like, oh, by the way, tell the police that I love your dad. You know, like, that's right. just 
a weird, you know, it's definitely alarming. Red flags there for sure. So once Stephen was fully examined, it was found that he had a hole the size of an orange in his upper oh right abdomen. Oh my gosh. And yes, the shot actually damaged several organs. Um, his colon was severely damaged and the risk of infection was extremely high. So he actually underwent surgery, uh, emergency surgery, and the doctors worked to remove a very large portion of his colon. And because they, you know, took so much of it out, they actually had to create an ileostomy. Um, so skin grafts were then used to close this big wound, and he was taken to the ICU for recovery. On October 2nd, which was the very next day, the police went and talked to Tracy at her home. Of course, as we said, the twins gave Tracy's name. The police are now following up on this. So they meet with Tracy, and she gives them a statement and, of course, says that she has nothing to do with the shooting. And uh, she even gave the police her shotgun. So the police are like, hey, do you have any weapons? She's like, yeah, I have this shotgun. And she's thinking, you know, this woman that I love and care for has collected the shotgun shell so I can give them my gun and there's no way this is going to come back to me. She didn't realize that Celeste had not taken the shotgun shell and that the police already had that. So she's literally handing over the shotgun that the police already have the shell casing bullet match, you know, goes right to this gun. So during this interview with Tracy, she doesn't mention anything about the fact that she knows Celeste or is in any kind of friendship or relationship with Celeste. So on October 3rd, officers visit Stephen in the ICU. And at this point, he's conscious, but he's not in really good shape or anything. He can't talk because he has tubes hooked up and they're going down his mouth and his throat. So the officers are just kind of talking to him and gauging his reactions to the things that they're saying. And at one point when they mentioned Tracy's name, Stephen became very agitated. On October 4th, the officers returned to Stephen's bedside to hopefully talk to him some more and try to observe his behavior a little bit more. And it was also on this day that Celeste told the officers that she no longer was giving her consent for them to search their home. And uh, the police never were able to have a conversation with Stephen, not on this day and not on any day going forward, because Celeste was really just kind of setting the, you know, setting the rules for what was going down with that. So on the next day, October 5th, the police went back to the hospital and there was now a sign on Stephen's ICU room door that said no visitors, including the police, and there were no visitors going to be allowed unless Celeste herself was present whenever they were there. There was one day that a family friend even tried to go visit Stephen in the ICU and, of course, was turned away because the sign on the door, you know, that nobody can go in unless Celeste is there. So Celeste found out that this person tried to go into Stephen's ICU room and she was mad. She called up this guy, was angry, and said that he was not allowed to come back and visit Stephen ever again. Those were her words, which, what in the world? Can you imagine, like... His friend is trying to come see him, knows that he's in the ICU, has had this terrible accident. Nobody knows what's going on. And then the wife is calling you up like, you can never see him again. Like, that doesn't- You might as well put a giant arrow above your head. Yeah. Yeah. That's just like, it's me. You figured it out. Right. So on October 8th, a few days later, the ballistics report came back. And of course, the shotgun shell was a match to the shotgun they took from Tracy, just like we said. Uh, Tracy was then arrested, and she was charged with injury to an elderly individual. Celeste had no reaction to learning that her friend was arrested. Tracy actually was able to post bail, and she was released. And the police returned to her home to do a more thorough and complete search. And it was there that they found photos of Tracy and Celeste together. And they found a calendar that even had entries with activities and dates and things that the two women had done together in the recent past. A couple of weeks later, a random anonymous letter was received by a newspaper reporter involved in the coverage of Stephen's ongoing story. The letter allegedly was from a friend of Celeste. It says that Celeste is, quote, one of the most giving people in the world, end quote, and that her marriage to Stephen was really idyllic. They had a caring relationship, and her husband adores her. And the letter also details Celeste's traumatic life, the sexual abuse that was at the hands of her father and her brother, and the horrific domestic abuse by her first husband, and several other health problems, including having ovarian cancer. This letter alleged that Celeste and Tracy became friends, and they bonded over their similar trauma issues. In this letter, it said that Celeste made it clear that Tracy and Celeste were just friends. 
The letter said that Tracy became obsessed with Celeste and that said Tracy was quote unquote crazy. The letter ends with this plea to the reporter to treat Celeste fairly in his stories, which that's a really nice friend to go out on a limb (laughs) on this and have so much information and make you sound so good. And so although this letter is anonymous and allegedly from a third party, Christina's boyfriend later claimed that he found this exact letter saved on the Beard family computer, meaning that Celeste is the author of this letter. (laughs) It's like the Jersey Shore letter, but years before. Yeah. So a couple of months passed. Right. (laughs) And it seemed like Stephen was on the mend and he was going to make a recovery. In the meantime, though, Celeste is out spending as much of Stephen's money as she possibly could. On December 7th, Stephen's transferred to a rehab center where he spends about seven weeks. On January 18th, 2000, Stephen's released to go home, back to the same home that he shared with Celeste. And he, oh my gosh. can you imagine? And that gives me anxiety. I know, no, just thinking about him having to go yeah. back and how he must have felt about right. that. And so Stephen's in a wheelchair. He's in lots of pain, especially whenever he's been moving from you know, the chair to the bed and vice versa. And this gunshot wound requires very careful cleaning and observation. And he had that ileostomy. And so he, he needs care. He can't really do any of this on his own. And so he's sent home though, with a rash in his groin area. The day after Stephen gets home, Celeste calls the doctor to complain about the care that Stephen got at the rehab center, referring to him coming home with this rash. And so she asks, can Stephen be examined by the ER? And this doctor, Dr. Kosika, agreed. And he found that Stephen's rash wasn't that bad, but he admitted Stephen anyway to treat, quote, significant yeast infection. And so this day, Stephen was complaining of chest pain the entire time. And his white blood cells were really high as well. Three days after he's been admitted to the hospital, Stephen begins to worsen. At 8 a.m. on January 22nd, his heart rate increased, his chest pain was worse, and his blood pressure dropped. His temperature was over 102, and he was delirious. A blood test revealed that he had a staph infection, and an antibiotic was ordered but wasn't started until 1 p.m. that day. Later that same afternoon, Stephen passed away. The cause of death listed by the attending doctor was septic shock. An autopsy was performed by Dr. Roberto Bayardo, and the immediate cause of death was found to be blood clots in Stephen's legs. The blood clots were a result of the inactivity following the shooting, and they traveled to his lungs and lodged in his pulmonary arteries. They also found that Stephen had bronchopneumonia and sepsis resulting in infection that started in the lungs. The official cause of his death was determined to be pulmonary embolism and bronchopneumonia with sepsis as a complication of the gunshot wound. Celeste told her twin daughters about Stephen's death and said that it was his dying wish that they would never cooperate with the police. Again, imagine your mom telling you this. Like, it just sounds crazy to be like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your stepdad has died. And also it was his dying wish that you never talk to the police. Like, that's... Obviously, something's going on with that. Yeah. So after Stephen passed away, Tracy was actually charged with murdering him. Tracy, not Celeste. And his funeral was held a few days later. Celeste and the twins and each of their boyfriends rode together to the funeral in a limo. And everybody that was in the limo said that Celeste was really in a pretty good mood. She was laughing and joking along the way. And then when they actually arrived at the funeral... Celeste kind of changed her demeanor and she turned on the waterworks and she acted as though she was just very upset and very distraught. After the funeral, Celeste was in really good spirits again. On the way home from the funeral, they were in the limo and Celeste asked the driver to please stop at a shopping center. So this particular shopping center, as we said before, Stephen owned a lot of property. He was very big in that area, in the Texas area, and he, you know, owned this big news station. He also owned some shopping centers. And so they stopped at one of the shopping centers that was owned by Stephen so that Celeste could just kind of go in there and just be mean, pretty much. I mean, she 
just wanted to go there to harass the employees there. So they go to the shopping center and Celeste gets out of the limo, walks into one of the stores and just kind of announces that she owns the place now. And she told the staff, you know, they were just going to have to do what she wanted. She had some choice words that were very not moms and murder friendly, (laughs) but she basically told them, you know, that they could kiss her butt. And that was, you know, that, but not in such a very friendly way. She didn't say it in a cute Mandy way. (laughs) (laughs) I assume it was later learned that in the four months between the shooting and when Steve died, Celeste actually spent over $700,000 of his money, which Like, I made the joke earlier that I could spend $500,000 in six months, but I don't know if I actually could. That actually is a lot of money. I definitely don't think I could spend $700,000 in four months. That's just, I mean, what else do you even need after you just spent a half a million dollars, you know, a few months ago? I just don't understand, like, what you even spend that kind of money on at that point. So about two weeks after Steve's death, Celeste completely unraveled. She told her twins that she was really so depressed that she wanted to kill herself and she was upset that people were talking about you know her and her potential involvement with Stephen's death and she just didn't like really all the rumors and I'm sure she did feel like an outcast there were a lot of people talking you know about what she could or you know could or couldn't have done in this case um and so she she said that you know she told her daughters I do feel so down and out that you know I'm ready to end my own life but she said I don't want to die alone so she tried to convince her twin daughters teenage daughters to take their own lives as well with her and um she even went so far as to buy her daughters matching pink coffins for this suicide pact that they have now formed that is the most, I think, disturbing thing that I've heard. Out of, there's so much in this story that I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much wrong with everything. But this particular yeah. part, I just cannot imagine doing that. I cannot imagine looking at my kids and trying to convince them to do something like that. No. That's just beyond comprehension to me. I can't even pretend to try to understand that. So this is obviously a lot to take in. And if you're thinking, you know, we're past the worst of it, where there's nothing else crazy going to happen in the story, you would be wrong. There are still some very, very wild details to come. But first, we're going to take one last break to hear our word from this week's sponsors. Self-care has been especially hard over the last year, but it's also incredibly important. If you aren't sure where to start on your self-care journey, take a look at FabFitFun. The FabFitFun Spring Box is centered around the theme Grow Forth because they want to support both self-care and self-growth in the new season and beyond. FabFitFun is your one-stop shop for self-care. I am so excited every time a new box comes in because I already know I'm going to find my new favorite things. They truly have it all, including 20 female-founded brands in the Spring Box this season. One of my must-haves in this newest box is the Billion Dollar Brows 6-Piece Pro Brush Essentials Kit. These brushes are amazing quality and they definitely elevate my makeup game, which admittedly needed some help. And to think, without FabFitFun, I wouldn't have found them. I was excited to see Nail Zinc Nail Polish in my box. It's the perfect shade of pink and gives me salon perfect nails every time. The thing I most enjoy about FabFitFun is that I'm always finding new products that quickly become my new favorites. And being a FabFitFun member means I get things like early shipping and early access. Order your spring box today. Sign up now so you can snag amazing products like the Billion Dollar Brows Six Piece Pro Brush Essentials Kit or Nails Ink Nail Polish when you customize. Use coupon code MOMS for $10 off your first box at www.fabfitfun.com. Order your spring box today. Sign up now so you can snag amazing products like the Billion Dollar Brows Six-Piece Pro Brush Essentials Kit or Nails Ink Nail Polish when you customize. Use coupon code MOMS for $10 off your first box at www.fabfitfun.com. There are a few things I'm a little embarrassed about, things like the amount of ketchup I use on my food or the number of times in a row I've played the song Driver's License. But something I have zero shame about is my love of playing Best Fiends. Best Fiends is a match three puzzle game unlike any other. It's fun and quick and the perfect boredom buster. I'm on level 1300 and it's still just as fun as the first time I played it. Whether you're playing while you walk the dog or waiting in line at the grocery store, it's always the perfect time to play Best Fiends. And what makes Best Fiends so unique is that it's not only so fun to play, but there's literally thousands of levels with new characters and content added all the time so you'll never get bored. 
Speaking of bored, you know that time you spend in your car after you get home just waiting for the end of the song driver's license? That's the perfect time to play a quick round. A few days ago, I had to play the same level several times before I finally completed it. Right afterwards, I won two more levels in a row. Now, I've never won an Olympic gold medal, but I've got to say, this feeling can't be that different. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Hey guys, as you know, I'm someone who loves knowing a little about everything. I love the news, I love entertainment, I love it all. But sometimes I don't have enough time to get all the information, all the little details and the minutia of everyday news because my goodness, it's constantly going. But thanks to the Newsworthy podcast, I can get all I need in little bite-sized pieces. So if the stress of the news is getting you down, but you still want to know what's going on in things like the election, check out the Newsworthy. And in these 10-minute episodes, they're just on the go listening. I can listen to it quickly on a walk, on my way bringing my kids to or from school or one of their activities. When I'm in line at the grocery store, there's never a wrong time to listen to the newsworthy. But if you feel bogged down by the news and kind of the negativity of it, but you still want to be informed on what's going on, the newsworthy is the place to do it. Erica at the newsworthy is an independent journalist and her team does really all the hard work and research for you. I love that the episodes are so well rounded and there will be fun stuff like tech or big stories. But the way Erica gives this, you know, efficient and neutral overview of the news and in just 10 minutes each weekday, it's it's perfect. Just search The Newsworthy in your podcast app or go to thenewsworthy.com to start listening. Again, search for the podcast The Newsworthy, two words, The Newsworthy, to make staying informed easier and more enjoyable every weekday. And now back to the episode. So we've been talking about the murder of Stephen Beard. Now Tracy's been uh, charged with murder and Celeste is asking her daughters to fulfill some sort of a suicide pact because she doesn't want to die alone and she feels like people are judging her for her husband's death, which they are. So since police were made aware that there is some type of relationship, possibly this romantic one between Celeste and Tracy, they decide to look in the phone records. Between August 29th and October 1st, 96 calls were made between them, totaling 336 minutes. Eight of these calls are on the day of the murder, in total 15 minutes on the phone that day. And there were eight calls, so these 15 minutes, these are very quick conversations relaying probably, you know, small bits of information, I'm here, you're here, that sort of thing. From October 2nd, day after the shooting, through January 26th, there are 94 calls totaling 389 minutes. Celeste tells her daughters that, you know, she's not speaking to Tracy anymore, but she clearly was. The twins even went so far as to have all of their numbers, including their moms, changed so Tracy would stop contacting their mom. On January 22nd, the day that Stephen died, it was learned that Christina's boyfriend actually found this random cell phone that was in Celeste's car. Police go through this unknown phone and they find about 50 calls that were made to another cell phone that was later determined to be Tracy's between January 8th and January 26th. So many calls. The calls were less frequent between the end of January until June. There were only actually 35 calls in six months as opposed to this two-week period where there's 50 calls. This secret phone apparently belongs to Tracy, but several people told police that they saw Celeste with that phone after Stephen's death. This is like a random fun fact, but Melissa and I literally just talked right before we started recording about our phone log and how it was funny because when Melissa went to call me tonight, she said she actually had a lot of numbers before me and it was like four people yeah. that she's <laughs> talked to since we last talked. Um, so yeah, when I was reading, um, learning about like how often these two communicated and how many calls there were, I was like, oh my gosh, I guess it was just a different time because there is no way I would ever have any one person that I'm communicating with by phone that often. No, <laughs> like it was just way too much. so many times that they were calling each other. Yeah. So another strange thing that Celeste did after Stephen died was to hire a personal assistant. Now, I'm not really sure why she did this or why she needed a personal assistant, but that's what she did. So she hired a woman named Donna Goodson and Donna got a firsthand look at Celeste and what her behavior was like after Stephen's death. 
She later told investigators about a time that Celeste went to the bank and wanted to talk to the bank officials because she was trying to get more information about Stephen's trust and what she needed to do in order to gain access of these accounts. The bank said, you know, let's pump the brakes here. You know, he has just passed away. There's a lot of money going, you know, there's a lot of accounts. There's a lot going on. Let's take a, you know, a slower look at this. And not only that, but also we would like to limit your withdrawals from this trust. And Celeste, of course, is like, no, you can't do that. This is my money now. You know, she was Celeste. She was the way that she right. was. So she was angry. And she had this crazy outburst at the bank. Again, it was things that things that she said to the bank teller are things we're not going to say on our show. But Melissa and I both were, like, texting each other, like, imagine being at a bank and somebody is doing this or acting this way. It was just scary. You know, the way she was acting was scary and just very unhinged, outrageous. You know, there's no other word to describe it. So according to Donna, who's now her personal assistant, Celeste partied all night long and then she would sleep all during the day. And at this time in her life, this is after Stephen's death, Celeste is going out every single night. She's frequenting these local night, you know, hot spots and having a lot of casual relationships. And it was during this phase, you know, of her life that she met a bartender named Cole Johnson. And eventually they would become husband and wife. On February 10th, 2000, Celeste and Donna went to the Houston Rodeo together, which if you're from Texas, you know what a big deal the Houston Livestock and Rodeo is. It's a very, very big deal. Melissa, you probably don't know what a big deal the rodeo is. Do I'm you? sorry. We Do had the know? rattlesnake roundup. <laughs> so I will take your rodeo and raise it one rattlesnake roundup. Thank you very much. Got to be yeah, the same yeah. thing. <laughs> I've mentioned before. Yeah, I've mentioned before on the podcast that I um, kind of grew up in Houston for like half of my childhood. Uh, my little sister was actually born in Houston. My dad's whole family was from Texas. And so we when I was a kid growing up, I remember going to the rodeo like when the rodeo oh, was in cool. town and it was a huge event. Yeah. And you know how I was. I listened. I grew up in the 90s. I listened to 90s country. And so obviously at the rodeo, that's who those are your performers. Right. You, know, you have your Garth Brooks and your really they would come so yeah oh my gosh yes the rodeo was a huge freaking deal not just it wasn't just about like cows everywhere but yeah they have concerts and all kinds of stuff clowns all, okay rodeo clowns you oh my went gosh, from Melissa. garth brooks to clowns <laughs> that was not a good <laughs> you got to go up not down anyway yeah anyway no the um houston rodeo is a very big deal so all that to say celeste and donna attended the rodeo together and celeste set each of them up on a date i guess a blind date for donna i'm not really sure but there was two guys there that were accompanying celeste and donna to the rodeo so afterwards they got a hotel room and celeste and donna were staying in the same room while they were in the room celeste just continued with her very unusual behavior and you know she this is her personal assistant, by the way. This is somebody that she works with as a professional. She is hired to. We assist don't know. Her we don't know personally. exactly. I don't. I st- <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not really sure still what Donna's role was. But Celeste made this inappropriate comment about Donna's breast size, and Donna just kind of laughed it off, and she was like, "Oh, ha ha, yeah." you know, my body is real and made some kind of comment. And then Celeste, who wasn't really asked, you know, for any further commentary, just kind of ripped open her own shirt and showed her own breast to Donna and was like, hey, do you want to touch my breast? And Donna was like, no, I don't. Thank you. And so that was it. But Donna is getting like a very firsthand view of how Celeste is and kind of right. her erratic and very strange and not socially acceptable, you know, behavior. Like this is just how Celeste is. So after this trip to Houston, the two women went to Lake Charles, Louisiana, and the plan was to go to this casino that was there. At this point, they're traveling together. They're having hotel rooms together. Obviously, Celeste is very comfortable with Donna, as I just said. Uh, So she starts openly talking to Donna about Stephen's death and about Tracy and kind of just about Celeste's role in all of this. So after hearing what Celeste had to say, Donna, you know, says to Celeste, hey, it's really possible that Tracy is actually working with the police and you should probably consider that and be careful, you know, with what you say and what you do. So Celeste then casually asked Donna if she knew of anybody who could get rid of Tracy. And Donna said, quote, anyone can get rid of anyone for the right amount. So instead of Donna encouraging, you know, Celeste to 
stop this nonsense idea that she has forming in her head, Donna actually is kind of encouraging it and saying, yeah, you can get rid of anybody you want if you have enough money. So Celeste really ran with this advice and she kind of continued on this path and with this conversation and she actually gave Donna $500 to hire a hitman for her. And she went so far as to even show Donna where Tracy lived and what her car looked like. So she was 100% willing to go through with this. Yes. So time went on and Donna did not kill Tracy. And Celeste was really getting impatient with this and starting to put the pressure on Donna to commit this murder for her. And Donna said, you know, I just can't do it, not for the money that you gave me, not for $500. She said she wanted to have more money. So Celeste said, sure, I'll give you whatever you want. And she actually made additional payments to Donna for this hitman to kill Tracy. And she paid a lot of money. She made two payments of $2,500 and one payment of $7,460. So that was a total of $12,460, which would be equal to over $19,000 today, which honestly, in the stories that we tell on the podcast, I feel like $19,000 is a lot of money to hire a hitman when you hear about some stories where people do it for like 500 bucks. Yeah, like $10 and a Pepsi or something. Right, exactly. So Celeste actually tried to hide the fact that she gave this money to Donna, but her daughter Christina found out and said, you know, hey, what's going on with this? Where did all this money go? Celeste became absolutely irate and told Christina that, you know, she needed to back off and mind her own business and actually threatened to kill her own daughter if she continued to pursue, oh you know, gosh. looking into where this $19,000 went. Yeah. So eventually she did admit to Christina that she did use the money and she used the money to hire somebody to kill Tracy. At this time, she tells Christina that she has called off this plan, you know, this hit on Tracy. But at this point, Christina has already recorded everything and she turns all of this over to the police. Yeah. She also found some love letters that were between Celeste and Tracy that she handed over to the police as well. The twins actually stopped talking to their mom around this time, and they said that it was because when she actually admitted that she hired a hitman and wanted Tracy killed, the girls knew that the only reason Celeste would do that is because she had some kind of a guilty conscience about what happened to her ex-husband, Steve. And at this point, they really felt like their was a pretty good certainty that their mom had actually put Tracy up to the shooting when it came to Steve's death. So it was not long after that Donna, her personal assistant, also stopped talking to Celeste. Celeste actually accused Donna of stealing items that Celeste had given her. And so their relationship kind of fizzled out and deteriorated. And I I guess she fired her or maybe Donna quit. And Donna just kind of left the picture at this point. So at this point, things are really starting to unravel for Celeste. In April of 2000, she's hospitalized for mental health issues. And upon her release, she says that she, quote, behaved in a very normal way. In June of 2000, it's been about three weeks since she and Tracy had talked. Tracy calls her and Celeste says, I don't want to talk to you. In July of 2000, Celeste actually marries the Austin bartender named Spencer Johnson. And during the same month, a protective order was issued to Celeste, and she was no longer able to communicate with her twins at all. So whoa, 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 whoa. This is (laughs) a lot going on very quick, very uh, rapidly, but not being able to even communicate with your kids. Obviously, she's threatened to kill them, so it's not that surprising and wanted a suicide pact, but it is like... That's a big step to have a protective order against, or they have one against her. And at this time, she also sells Stephen's houses, and they sold for about $2 million in total. She then moves to South Lake, Texas uh, with her new husband, Spencer, and they buy a house worth about half a million dollars. Time just continues to go on, and in March of 2002, Tracy learns that Celeste has gone off and remarried. And so at this point, this kind of sets her off, and she decides to make a plea agreement with the prosecution. She's offered a 20-year sentence in exchange for cooperating in Celeste's prosecution. Tracy tells police that, yes, she did shoot Stephen, but Celeste is the one that planned the murder and put her up to it, and also gave her detailed instructions on how to do it. Tracy tells police that she drives up to Celeste's house just after 2 a.m. on October 2nd, The gates open, and Tracy parks her car near the twins' bedroom. 
she goes in through the unlocked door, goes into the bedroom, shoots Stephen in the stomach. She gets back in her car and leaves. She keeps the gun, doesn't get rid of it because it's a personalized shotgun. And of course, Celeste had one job and she was supposed to dispose of the shell, which she didn't do and the officers immediately found. Tracy also says that after the shooting, she and Celeste remain in contact. They would talk on the phone, like we said, or they would meet in a park. Shortly before Stephen came home from the rehab center, Celeste told Tracy that she was not going to be hiring any in-home help to help her husband with his wound care. She even said that she was going to reinfect Stephen's wound. After Stephen died, most of the contact between these two women stopped. For her cooperation, Tracy was actually given an even shorter sentence of 10 years in prison, followed by 12 years of probation, which as the shooter is a very, very small amount in comparison to what it could be. Celeste's twin daughters also turned on her and helped police with their case. Jennifer said that on October 1st, Celeste suggested that she and her boyfriend go spend the weekend at the lake house. And of course, your mom's offering you to stay at a lake house. You're going to take, take up that offer. So between 9 and 10 that night, though, Celeste shows up with Stephen's dog. This dog is really old and ill, and he always slept in the bed with Stephen at night. Celeste tells her daughter, Stephen's drunk and he's been hitting the dog, so I need to you know, bring him somewhere. So Jennifer and her boyfriend thought this was really weird because Stephen loved the dog and he never mistreated him. So they agreed to keep the dog overnight at this lake house. They said that Celeste seemed really nervous and very distracted, and she leaves the lake house around 10.30 p.m. Christina then gives her account. She says that on October 1st, she's going to dinner and a movie with her boyfriend. She normally didn't have a curfew, but that night her mom told her to be home by midnight, and she got home around 11. Christina's boyfriend would usually spend the night, but Celeste told him that he was not allowed to spend the night that night. He leaves around midnight, and Celeste is not at the house whenever the boyfriend leaves. Christina goes to bed, and she wakes up later with Celeste standing in her doorway. And that's whenever Celeste says to her, someone's at the front door and says, Christina, you go check it out, which a mom never oh does gosh, that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that is so weird. Nobody would ever say like, hey, I'm your mother. Too scared to go see who's at the front door. Please get up and go. No. <laughs> so Christina goes to see who it is. And that's when she sees these flashing lights of police and emergency vehicles. On March 28, 2002, Celeste is finally charged with Stephen's murder. The indictment alleged that Celeste killed Stephen for his money. Celeste's trial began on February 3, 2003. The prosecution was not seeking the death penalty, but the prosecutors alleged that Celeste killed Stephen for his money, his estate, and his assets. They brought up the fact that Steve had filed for divorce less than a year after he married Celeste, but then had withdrawn the petition later and they reconciled. So the prosecution was alleging that Celeste was worried that he was going to divorce her sometime in the future, possibly very soon, and that would leave her with only the $500,000 instead of three and a half million, you know, roughly is what she was going to be entitled to. So they were saying that she wanted him dead before he could divorce her so that she could get her hands on all the rest of this money. The prosecution said that she, quote, manipulated a psychologically unstable woman, who was Tracy, seducing her and convincing her to kill Stephen, end quote. The defense, however, painted a completely different picture, and they said that Celeste was the victim of a very deranged woman. They painted Tracy as being delusional, obsessed with Celeste, and said that she killed her husband out of jealousy. The defense also said that there was no love affair or any conspiracy to commit murder and that the shooting was a lone act by a lonely and obsessed woman. The twins also testified against Celeste, but the defense said that this was a move that the twins did simply for money and not because they actually thought their mom was guilty. Because if Celeste went to jail, then her share of the trust was going to go to Stephen's kids and then also to the twins. But That wasn't really the case, and the twins actually had a lot to say on the stand. They knew about the relationship with Tracy, and Christina even had a key to Tracy's house, and she would go there in the mornings to wake her mom up sometimes. In 1999, Celeste actually had a party for the employees of the store that Tracy managed, and 
they held this party at the lake house, of course, that Stephen had owned and built while he was married to Celeste. So the people who were there at this party saw Tracy and Celeste kissing and holding hands and just being really intimate and friendly with each other. The next day, Christina and her boyfriend went to the lake house to clean up after this party and found Celeste and Tracy in bed together at the lake house. Christina said that during 1999, she also drove Celeste to Jimmy's house to stay the night. As we said, Jimmy was the ex-husband that she had an affair with. Celeste even held a high school graduation for the twins at Jimmy's house. My gosh. Which is just it's just it's so much to me but the twins and their friends witness all of this and they witness celeste drugging and slipping alcohol to steven all of these things they testified to in court in celeste's trial an infectious disease doctor testified that steven died with group a strep which is a very serious infection and it is often fatal but they believe that this infection entered his body through the groin infection and it was not related to the gunshot wound, which is really interesting. So another doctor agreed and said that Stephen's gunshot wound was healing well. And by the time that Stephen was released from the hospital and had he had already been through seven weeks at a rehab center, this was months after his gunshot wound had occurred. And they definitely had that under control. That was well on its way in advanced stages of healing yes he was still recovering but the actual wound itself they're saying was nowhere near you know it wouldn't have been likely that that would have gotten infected at that point it had been so long and his body was handling it very well so they were saying that the infection the uh, group a strep infection he got was introduced through the groin infection that he came home with from the rehab center Both of the doctors that testify agreed that Stephen died of septic shock from the strep infection, but they were unsure of exactly how he contracted this infection. Numerous family friends testified in the trial and told detailed accounts of Celeste's behavior. One friend named Amy said that Celeste put sleeping pills in Steve's food and called him names and said that she wished he would die on a regular basis. One of Stephen's friends, however, testified the opposite, said that Celeste brightened Stephen's life and this friend doubted that Celeste was poisoning her husband or was even capable of doing something like that so then Tracy also took the stand she talked about this romantic relationship that she had with Celeste and how Celeste is really you know the one responsible for convincing her to kill Stephen this alleged lesbian relationship was a huge focal point in the trial As we said before, the defense denied that there was any romantic relationship and that Celeste did not ask Tracy to kill Stephen. And the prosecution alleged that there was a sexual relationship and that Celeste manipulated Tracy into committing this murder under the premise that they would be together as a couple after that. There was also plenty of conflicting witness testimony about the likelihood of this relationship being legitimate. As we said, many people testified kind of in both directions it was really weird so one psychotherapist who did one session with celeste testified that she doubted celeste was a lesbian and said that from the conversation celeste had with her it seemed like celeste always needed alcohol to be romantic or sexual with tracy so in her mind that proved that celeste wasn't really into it and wasn't really interested in a romantic relationship and that alcohol was kind of the crutch there but like we said there was plenty of conflicting reports about whether Celeste was truly invested in this relationship romantically or if it was kind of a ruse or whatever the case may be. That's really like the main thing from this case is whether or not they were actually in a relationship. A friend of the twins testified that Celeste was having a real affair with her ex-husband, Jimmy. And even more strange, a woman that was in jail with Tracy testified that she and Tracy talked about the case and that Tracy never once said that Celeste persuaded her to kill Stephen. This woman, named Katina Lofton, said that Tracy told her that she shot Stephen because he, quote, never cared for her. Tracy allegedly called Celeste after the shooting to ask her to pick up the shell casing, and Celeste was allegedly hysterical, and she hung up the phone. Katina claimed that Tracy admitted to making up the story about Celeste manipulating her and said she was going to lie about Celeste so that she could get a shorter sentence. Tracy also allegedly said that she loved Celeste, but Celeste didn't love her back, so she wanted revenge. In a twist, Katina actually met Celeste in jail, and they began writing letters to each other. Katina asked Celeste for money. She gives her $200, which is very 
interesting to me that all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, yeah. we have a witness. And they happen to know right. something about Celeste and she's sending her money. Yeah, so there's psychiatrists who work with Tracy at Timberlawn, and they said that Tracy was depressed in late 1998 and early 1999. She was suicidal and delusional and felt that she was very untruthful during her sessions. Back when Tracy and Celeste first met and shared a room at that facility and they were caught being romantic, the two were separated. And Tracy told one psychiatrist that this problem, quote, would be solved if certain people met with untimely deaths, end quote. Another psychiatrist said that Tracy suffered from bipolar disorder and she had delusional beliefs. She thought that Stephen was the one that was pulling Celeste away from her. Another psychiatrist said that Tracy had, quote, pathological obsessive attachment, and we think that would be um, the attachment to Celeste. So Tracy used alcohol along with her psychiatric medications. And of course, this is not a good combination and it caused delusions. And according to another psychiatrist, they said, quote, made her capable of imagining a relationship. This therapist testified that Tracy had a pattern of falling in love with straight women. Psychologists that worked with Celeste at Timberlawn also testified that She'd been sexually abused as a child. She had OCD and trouble setting boundaries and was definitely a people pleaser. They said she was not impulsive, not good at planning things out long term, which I don't know if I believe that. If you move to Texas with somebody overnight, I feel like you're a little impulsive. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So the jury deliberates in this trial for a total of 23 hours over the course of three days. On March 13th, Celeste is found guilty of capital murder, injury to an elderly individual, and criminal solicitation of capital murder. She's sentenced to life in prison for the murder and fined $10,000 for injuring an elderly person in five years for the solicitation. She's made several attempts to appeal, and all have failed. Celeste is currently at Murray Prison in Gatesville, Texas. She's eligible for parole on April 1st, 2042. She'll be in her late 70s then. She actually wrote a biography with two authors while she was in prison, and it's called, what else, but The Celeste Beard Story, the exclusive biography. Tracy was released from prison in August of 2011. She moved to San Antonio and said, quote, I don't wake up a single day without feeling ashamed for what I did, end quote. In a weird and terrible coincidence, one of Celeste's twin daughters, Jennifer, was actually shot at a Halloween party in 2017. She was badly injured, needed 10 surgeries. She was shot in the stomach, much like her stepdad, and her core muscles were so weak that she could barely walk. She's unable to work now and depends on her twin sister, Christina. Oh my gosh, this whole story... There's so much to it and there's so many aspects of the story that break your heart and so many that make you angry and there's just a right. lot really going on in this story. I know I know we say that about some, you know, other stories that we've talked about before. This time but we mean it. This one. Just kidding. <laughs> we really mean it this time. There, Yeah, there is really a lot going on in this one and that's one thing um, that I love about true crime is that I feel like when you feel like you've heard it all, like, unfortunately, you haven't heard it all. And like you there's definitely more and crazier stories out yeah. there in this one. I think this one has uh, some of the most just crazy, shocking details, you know, that we've had in these stories. Yeah. Just a terrible story all around. I can't I can't imagine being anybody in this story. Yeah, it's really. like anyone that's that's connected to her just tragedy happens to them you know just it's just bad all the way around yeah and I thought it was interesting in this case how the uh, prosecution and the defense both really focused their cases on this relationship between Celeste and Tracy and I don't think that was necessarily the correct focus Um, but I feel like they did a lot of digging into whether or not they had a romantic relationship and they were trying to kind of justify like everyone's behavior based around that and I didn't really agree with that you know, technique where like the defense was like Tracy was just obsessed with Celeste and there was nothing there right. and she did this on her own. And then the prosecution was like, no, Tra- uh, Celeste manipulated Tracy and led her to believe that there was going to be a relationship and that's what happened. I personally think there was a little a little from column A and a little from column B going on there. I feel like there was a little of both. I think I don't think that Celeste was romantically interested in Tracy. I think that she saw an opportunity yeah. and 
kind of took advantage of it and took advantage of Tracy. And unfortunately, Tracy was in the state of mind to be manipulated, you know, by a person like Celeste. And she really kind of fell into the trap. And I think that Tracy really did feel feelings for Celeste and thought that there was going to be something between them. But I think Celeste never intended for that to be the case. I think Celeste was only using Tracy for this plan that she had to get rid of her husband. And all of it is just, it's just really, really sad and unfortunate. And it was just kind of this perfect storm of things that led to this really, really terrible and sad crime. So, Melissa, are we ready to turn the page and move on to last thing before we go? I'm actually kind of excited about this last thing before we go. As opposed to all the other ones, Mandy? My voice cracked. I mean, I'm excited about Mm. all of them. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes we just get excited about it. Sure. I'm excited about it, too. Yeah. This one's really fun. Yeah. I'm I'm the most excited because this was your idea. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. Okay. So, my idea that I don't know where it came from was to pick songs or different things from when we were 13. Why 13? Also don't know. Um, but it just popped in my head. And so I'm looking at a list of the like most popular songs from the year I was 13, which is 1996. Mandy's looking at whatever 2012 year she was 13. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're going to pick the, the top three songs that we see and see which ultimately which is the best song from the two the two years who had the best song of the year out of those two I don't know okay what's your first one what would you like to to give as the first uh first nominee okay so first of all I was turning 13 in 2000 which I know I was not (laughs) expecting that I don't I was totally kidding about 2012 but I was not expecting 2000 okay yes No. Well, actually, I didn't really realize it until you told me about this last thing before we go. And I was like, let me go and look what year I turned 13. And then I was like, oh, yeah, 2000. And then I remembered, actually, I remembered back to turning 13. And I always thought that was so cool that I was turning 13, like in the year 2000. At the time, I thought it was like the coolest thing ever. Um, But yeah, so so the number one song in the year 2000 should not come as any surprise to anyone who lived in the year 2000. Um, but it was Bye 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 by NSYNC. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. You've got you've got yeah. good stuff there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next one was The Real Slim Shady by Eminem. Wow. So these are basically just songs yeah, from my high and, school. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I have to do three? Yeah, do three, and then we'll pick the best overall. Okay. So then we also have Try Again by Aaliyah. Oh, R.I.P. Yeah, that's a good one. I like those. Those are good songs. They're all okay, good. Okay, ready? They are good. Wait for how old I feel whenever I found out this was number one. This is hard. Ready? Number one is Macarena. <laughs> oh, Did my gosh. Did you not just think that song was around <laughs> your entire life uh, by Los Del Rio? Yeah. <laughs> Next one, Mandy. I might get you to vote for this one. One Sweet Day by Mariah Carey and Boys to Men. Yes. 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 Slow jam. And the last one was eh, it's not my favorite one but because you loved me by Celine Dion oh I love all your songs yeah, too. yeah they're really good so if we had to pick the song we could listen to the most how about we say that which of those songs could you listen to the most current day I'm gonna go Mariah you can't go wrong I will never get tired of listening to Mariah and I would listen to one sweet day every single yeah. day for the rest of that's, my life if I had to. That's a good one. I think if I had to, yeah, I think I would go with the same one, which isn't very exciting. That was a very boring competition. But 1996 had some hits. They even had Come On, Ride That Train. That was, I played yeah. that for my daughter the other day and like did the dance that goes with it. And she was like, what is happening? <laughs> it's like, you had to be there. Listen, 2000, yeah, 2000 had a lot of awesome songs too. Eminem was on the charts. Stan was oh, also yeah. on there. Um, we... We had Beautiful Day by U2. We had Kryptonite by Three uh, Doors Down. Yeah. We had Mrs. Jackson by Outkast. Yeah, 2000 was popping with music, I have it, to say. Can I say popping? Am I too old no, for popping? No, it sounds like something you'd say in 2000, <laughs> so that works pretty well for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought a lot of these songs were a lot older, so that is, um, that's concerning to me. Fantasy from Mariah Carey, we had that. Oh, man, it's a good year. Good yeah. year. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Movies. Do you want to talk about uh, movies? Sure. Let's do that. This is a very long episode, everyone. I up. hope you're enjoying it. Yes. 
It is. Well, pe- they can come back to it. They can listen to it in, in waves if they would like. Um, <laughs> um, so we'll just do movies really quick and then we'll wrap this up. So 2000 movies. I didn't find box office yeah, yeah. hits like number ones, but I did find like I, I just Googled like 2000 movies and found out the ones. I'm assuming these are probably the most popular and it makes sense when you hear them. So in 2000, I have Castaway. Oh, wow. I have. Yeah, I have Gladiator. And I have Almost Famous. Also, Bring It On, The Perfect Storm, 28 Days, Miss Congeniality. 2000 <gasps> was the year. That was the year for movies, if you ask me. Well, I, I will raise you because in 1996, there was Black Sheep, the Chris Var- Farley, David Spade movie, oh. one of my all-time favorite movies. Uh, let's see what else did I have. Evita, Madonna's movie that I was not allowed to watch, but I really wanted to. And then the other one that I really liked, where did it go? Oh, Romeo and Juliet. I thought I was like, it was like the sweetest thing. At 13, you're just like, oh my gosh, this is like way too old for me. And I'm super into it. Wait, that reminds me of the one. What was the Cinderella one with Drew Barrymore? Wait, what was that one called? Ever After? It was Yes, I love that. I wonder what year that came out. Probably um, around that time. I think closer to yours. Well, no, we're only four years apart. Yeah, I don't know. I love those. I love all those movies. Those just old 90s movies. Oh, Ever After came out in 1998. Yeah, Split so it difference. was close, but it was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's great. I love taking a trip down memory lane and feeling nostalgic about, you know, music and movies and TV shows. Not so much TV shows. I already looked at 2000s TV shows and decided I just didn't even care. Friends was on the list. Um, you know, it wasn't even one that I cared about. Um, but they also had, and I'm so sorry. I've, I'm sorry if I offend anybody who likes friends. No, I'm, I'm not sorry. Friends. I'm not <laughs> sorry at all. Unapologetic. <laughs> yeah. No, but the other one from 2000, just really quick. Uh, you may not have looked up TVs, but I just have this pulled up in my tab. Um, in 2000, the top number one ranked show, of course, was Survivor. And then there was ER, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, Friends. And then on this list, also made the list, Monday Night Football made the list of most watched programs in 2000. We did so. not have streaming <laughs> channels then. There was not a lot to do. There was not a lot to do. Right. <laughs> CSI was really far down the list. It was number 11. But I remember CSI. watching CSI and loving it yes wow that one i did not know was out so long that's crazy yeah 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 so many good memories i just don't know they just don't make tv or music the way they did back then they make tv (laughs) shows even better so that's where you're missing out tv shows are awesome (laughs) now of course you think so (laughs) okay okay fine yes i do they're great (laughs) Um, Before we get going, we are going to be playing the promo for uh, Morph, our friend Morph. He has Criminology and several other podcasts, but he has a new podcast called Zodiac Speaking, which I can assume is about the Zodiac, uh, the Zodiac Killer. So yeah, so make sure you stick around to check that out. Criminality, my other show, has a new episode out now on Anna Nicole Smith. It actually has weird parallels between this episode and uh, that, but... um, more I love that story. Influence. I can't wait to listen to that. It's way crazy. I forgot whenever I talked about it that she, there was a freaking musical about Anna Nicole Smith. I've got to see that. I'm very invested in that idea Oh, yeah. Now, right? Yeah. It's been a while since I've heard anything about that story. But yeah, I'm excited to listen to that one because yeah. I totally forgot about that. But I remember it being a really crazy story. Yeah, it, it definitely is. So we'll be back next week. Oh, your turn. Your turn. Your, this is your thing. It's been such yeah. a long episode. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. I know. Hope you guys enjoyed this extra long episode mid-March. Hope you enjoyed this extra long mid-March episode. And we will see you back next week, hopefully for a regular length episode. Um, Same time, same place, new story. Have a great week. Bye. I'm Mike Morford, and I've been researching the Zodiac case for years. Zodiac, just the name. It sounds sinister. It inspires fear. The fact that a serial killer would give himself this moniker is disturbing. He would go on to taunt police by sending letters and codes to newspapers for years. And the attacks, they were something else altogether. If you were a young couple in a secluded area, you could easily be a target. And it wasn't just shootings on dark lovers' lanes. Zodiac would even attack with a knife in broad daylight while wearing an executioner-style hood. After a while, Zodiac changed tactics, and even lone cab drivers weren't safe. 
The Zodiac Killer terrorized the San Francisco Bay Area and then vanished, but he left a lot of clues behind along the way. Clues that we're going to examine closely on the new podcast, Zodiac Speaking. New episodes of Zodiac Speaking come out every other Saturday starting March 13, 2021. Subscribe today wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.